Today, I am doing a teardown of a 130 watt USB-C laptop power adapter. This is designed to be a replacement for a Dell power adapter. I looked this over in a previous video for its performance and identified that it does not have a safety listing. It also wasn't amazing for power performance. So there must be some reason for this on the inside and it's time to open it up and investigate how it's made and why it may or may not be compliant with typical safety requirements. I will be analyzing the electrical side of the power adapter. The first look will be what's inside, followed by some analysis of parts used, then the transformer, then some comments on what could be improved. In this teardown series, I like to open up electronics to find out what makes them work and what is inside. The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The components will be identified and analyzed as well as some of the safety aspects. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Patreon is now live as well as the super button. Thanks to my current patrons and channel supporters. So while I make a fool of myself trying to open up this adapter, don't end up in the hospital, don't end up in the hospital. I wanted to give a quick comment on the performance of this adapter. From the power performance, we saw that this adapter was a fairly basic adapter and it doesn't compare favorably to the likes of an official Dell power adapter. The adapter is going to crack open with giant pliers. The end popped right off and right away I see something I don't like. The adapter has a 3 pin connector and apparently an earthed power connector. What I see here is that there is not even a wire to the earth pin, so this should only have a 2 pin power cable. The benefit to building this adapter is that it would be cheaper to manufacturers to supply a 2 pin power cable with it and a smaller connector. So this is a waste of materials and money as a first pass. This is also going to give a false sense of hope that this device is safer than it really is. The adapter looks like it is pushed in from one end and glued in place inside the plastic shell. I didn't check if the plastic is actually flammable or not. The first thing I noticed that I don't like is that the metal shells wrap around and there is only one piece of tape between this shell and the secondary side of the adapter. I am checking to see if this metal shell has a connection to one of the main pins, like the AC mains, and it turns out that these metal shells are connected directly to the mains through one diode or the bridge rectifier. I'll identify what this is later on and we'll go through the details of each component. So it does have some isolation, but the issue here is that a sharp metal object on one side of a tape and another sharp metal object on the other side of the tape means that I wouldn't trust this over time to hold isolation. I think there is something to investigate here. After taking the tape and metal shields off, we get a look at what is going on inside this adapter. The transformer is installed through a cutout through the circuit board, which is very thin by the way, and from the looks of it, there is plenty of isolation here between the components at least. The big things that matter are the creepage, which is the distance on the circuit board between the components, and the clearance, which is the airspace between components. The spaces on the circuit board are all Pretty good, at least by visual appearance. So back to those metal shields. I noticed on the metal shield there is a cutout on one end and I wanted to see if this was just installed incorrectly. And it looks like that is the case. The metal shield shouldn't have been over the output side heatsink and the designers thought about this and it looks like in the factory this shield was just installed the wrong way around. Was this a safer option by design? But it looks like there was a quality control issue in the assembly process that made this a less safe device. I don't know. Okay, next we're going to take a walk through this power adapter and identify key components. I won't be explaining them all in detail, but let me know what you think can use more explanation. The first thing I noticed is that this device has a fuse on the AC input connection. The fuse is rated at 5 amps. This is the primary line of protection in the case of a fault within the power adapter. The next thing on the AC line is a capacitor, in this case a 0.1 microfarad X2 class capacitor with proper ratings. Then there's a common mode choke or inductor followed by a 0.22 microfarad X2 capacitor. These components work together to help keep the conducted radio interference under control. They don't do much for the power performance. On really cheap devices, these often get omitted. After that is the bridge rectifier. This has the markings of GBL610. It is a 1000 volt 6 amp rated diode bridge. This device is rated for over 100 amps peak current as well, so it's good for the job at hand. This device basically takes the AC waveform and turns it into a DC waveform, also known as rectification. Things start to get cheaper as we move to the next component. These are the main filter capacitors. They are 82 microfarads each and 400 volts from the brand Hire with KF type. They say 105 degrees C rated and they probably need it tucked in here. I didn't find any data sheets on these. While on the topic though, the standby voltage capacitor is also a Hire capacitor. The primary side controller is a 1342 AMD CD. This looks like it's pin compatible with this on semi chip. It isn't the chip 
is a clone, but functionally I am sure it is the same one. This looks like a basic flyback converter chip. This is exactly what kind of power supply this is. The primary side MOSFET connected to this controller is an NCE65T180, which is a 650 volt transistor. It has reasonably low capacitance and the on resistance is also not bad. There are many support components around the primary side controller. There are various diodes, capacitors, and resistors that make up the typical switching power supply circuits. These are likely exactly the recommendations from the datasheet. Next up is the transformer and the path through the circuit. This is going to be discussed in a while in a lot more detail. After that, we have the optocoupler that connects the control signals from the USB side to the AC side without making any physical electrical connection. The component here is an 817C and has a voltage rating of 5 kilovolts, more than adequate for this power adapter. There is an EMI suppression capacitor across the transformer. It is a 2.2 nanofarad rating with a 400 volts AC. It is also covered with appropriate marks for safety. Not bad. The next important component is the output MOSFET, which is functioning as a synchronous rectifier to improve efficiency as much as possible, and it has a tiny control chip. The MOSFET is a GO42N10 with a 3.5 milliohm on resistance. The control chip says DJOJJ on it, but I can't find any data sheet on this chip. There are three 680 microfarad 25 volt output capacitors, also from Hirei. Finally, there is a USB controller chip labeled with 2332217GE. Again, I can't find any information on this one. This is connected to a MOSFET to turn the output on and off. The control chip is what negotiates for the higher voltages when needed. There is also a current sense resistor in this section to check for overloads. These lead to the four wires that connect to the USB cable. One is for the LED. This has to be separate because the voltage on the main cable would change the brightness of the LEDs. Then a CC line, which is the wire that the USB voltage is negotiated over. Then two heavy wires, which are the positive and negative leads carrying the DC voltage and current to your device. These seem adequate. Let's focus in on the transformer, which on the outside does appear to be okay. Let's get it removed from the circuit board so we can take a closer look. The first thing I noticed is that they have a little covering on the wires leaving the low voltage side or the secondary side of the transformer. The isolation on the transformer, good on the outside, but we really need to dig deeper to find out if it's hiding some secrets. We all know it's bad, right? It has to be bad. Are we hoping that it's bad? So first thing we have to do is crack open the transformer core so we can get access to the windings. The enforcer is back to crack this thing open. The transformer is filled with lots of layers. It looks like everything is separated into more and more layers as we dig deeper. The primary side and secondary side wiring are both fairly heavy gauge. I stripped this section of the primary side wiring to see if the wires have an extra coating on the wire or if it is just a single layer of insulation. It looks like that it's just one layer since the wires are conductive. The first layer we find in the transformer is the auxiliary winding, which is what supplies the power to the circuits that keep the adapter running while in use. It looks like about 11 turns on this one, which seems high. I guess that's why the capacitor is 100 volts on the primary side. The next layer in this component is the first layer of the mains. Here we start to see that the tape is more or less symbolic as the wires run right next to and practically on top of one another between primary and secondary sides. The layer beneath this is the first secondary layer, five turns on the secondary, then another layer of primary, which is followed by another secondary, then the final primary, which gives us a total primary turns of about 28. This gives us the turns ratio of the transformer of about five and a half. So if there's 170 volts DC on the input, it's going to divide down to about 30 volts on the output. In the process of tearing this down, we find that the secondary and primary wires run directly on top of each other with no extra insulation tape between them. The transformer primary is wound with clear impact on the secondary wire, so this is not a nice sight to see. Basically, a little lacquer and one layer of insulation and the primary is connected to the secondary. This is not the worst transformer I've seen, but it's also not very good. I can see now why this device doesn't meet the full safety listing requirement because the transformer is a little too closely wound. I am curious to see how much capacitive coupling there is between the primary and secondary sides with this device. The turns ratio is fairly low on this device, and it has to be since the universal input voltage and lack of a correction circuit means that the voltage to the transformer input will vary, and to support from 100 VAC and up, this device has to have that lower ratio. That's about it. 
a cheap power adapter that doesn't have a safety listing. It moves a decent amount of watts, but the question is, can it do it for a reasonable length of time while not becoming a safety hazard? We found that from a power supply perspective, it is a basic flyback topology converter and is actually a fairly simple device. There were some issues with the assembly side of things that make it a little less safe than it should be. I don't like the metal shields wrapped around the output metal heatsink. This could have been done better. The ground pin is connected to nothing. The suppression capacitor was a rated capacitor and had an appropriate voltage rating for the use case. It looks like a little more of a quality control issue than a potentially unsafe device. It is obviously built down to a price and the main capacitors will have a lot of stress and probably won't last too long in the heat cocoon, but that all pales in comparison to the transformer, which tries on the outside then turns pretty bad on the inside. It makes me think about how much is crammed into the Dell power adapter and how things were done to get the global safety listings on that in such a small package. If you are interested in seeing inside of that one, let me know. Anyway, the transformer could certainly be constructed better with an extra barrier of isolation, double insulated wires, no main side or primary side wires directly touching the output or secondary side wires. It'll work as it is now, but in a year, maybe it'll start to give you a little surprise when you try and use it. I will have to check out the Dell now for contrast. Thanks for watching. Next week, I hope to get a short out on the Dell 130 watt USB-C adapter, as well as get a power bank video out. Didn't quite make it this week. Check out my website for upcoming videos. There's a schedule of release dates. I have many more of these adapters to get through, so many more videos in the future. Goodbye.